Welcome to ECE 501B. I need to make sure I'm in the right classroom. My name is Hal Tharp. I forgot to mention that in an earlier class today. I just went all lecture and they're going, which class am I in? Uh, they soon figured it out, I hope. But let's start with some formalities. I have two sheets. One is attachment one and the other is attachment two. Hopefully I will see most names on attachment two, which is the attendance sheet. Attachment one is if you aren't enrolled in the class but want to add the class. Attachment one hopefully will have very few seats or names on it, but make sure you sign one of those forms, attachment two, if you are in the class, enrolled in the class, and that's my way of doing attendance. This class is available not only to the students here in the classroom, but also as an online class. And that's one of the reasons I'm wearing a microphone. I can now record. You in the class will have the benefit of also having access to the lectures if you want to replay this over and over. It's just great listening. That's a stretch. but. Hopefully everyone will have access to D2L, and if you don't, let me know, and we'll see what we can do to try to make that happen. One of the first things I would like to do is have you complete a passport into the class so that I can start to identify you with a name and a face and give me your official name with a pronunciation guide. And then if you like to be called something other than your given name, give me that. That's your nickname. So if your given name is John and you're, you like to be called Jerry, then there's John and Jerry, Jerry being your nickname. And an email, a photograph that I can identify you with, meaning something that's somewhat up to date. I'm not very good at extrapolating in time from infancy to now, depending on where you fall. And tell me something interesting about you, a unique fact, what you like to do, what you can do, what you have done in the past. Maybe you've climbed every highest mountain on a particular continent. That's an interesting fact, something like that. Then. I want you to read a four-page write-up from Oklahoma State on how to read mathematics, which is right here, but you won't have time to read those four pages right now because I'm not going to leave it on. Maybe you've already read all four pages in that short amount of time. You're really good because I didn't even scroll through all four. But tell me then in item four, what spoke to you or what you took away from that. There's links to other articles within that article. Maybe you click on those and you find something in one of those other links that you find interesting or you think might be helpful. Write that up in a short paragraph. That's item four. And then on item five, I want you to have memorized the syllabus and the policies associated with it and with your signature acknowledge that you've paid a little bit more attention to the syllabus versus what we will have time to go through today. But here this is advanced linear systems theory is the class. There are several texts. The first one, the required one, is actually available through the U of A library as an ebook, and so you can should be able to access that through the the library link on the top menu bar of D2L or if you go to the library itself and search on the title you should be able to access that book. The second book which is required is sort of the second piece. The first book is finite dimensional vector spaces. The second book is infinite dimensional and that also is on the D2L website in the course resources module. And you can then find that. We will, and if you want to start reading that, you can, but it'll be quite a while or quite far into the semester before we officially get into infinite dimensions. 
but what we're learning in finite dimensions hopefully will be good foundational material to extend those ideas and concepts into an infinite dimensional setting. Optionally, there's the how to read and do proofs. There's a lot of books out there that talk about how to read and write proofs. And that's maybe what you might start to be thinking about when you're reading the four-page paper about how to read mathematics for the passport assignment. In terms of breakdown, point breakdown, we'll have two exams. And these are the dates that are right now assigned for those two exams. Our final exam is on a Tuesday in December. That seems like a long way off, but that will be here before we know it. And you might be making sure that you're available for that final exam. It's a little later in the day than what our class period is. And it's a Tuesday, not a Monday or a Wednesday. So on that particular week, you're going to have to sort of reschedule your time. It will be on a Tuesday, and it will be starting at 6 o'clock. And it's two hours. It will go until 8 o'clock. That's our final exam on the 13th of December. We do have one Monday that we won't be meeting. Maybe I'll make some material available, because I know that you're anxious to be learning. So I might post something, and you can learn and take advantage of that missing contact time between us so that you don't miss a beat during, on that particular day of Monday. Then the course outline, as you can see, we quickly go through, well, we don't quickly, we linearly go through the first textbook, which is Axler. And then we get into the second book, again, which is Infinite Dimensional sub or spaces, vector spaces in the Franks book, which is also in the course resources module on the D2L website. How are we doing for our goals? Attendance, please sign attachment two if you haven't already. Attachment one is if you want to take the class and are not yet enrolled. I already told you that we are recording the lectures, and those will be available to you. We've discussed the passport assignment. We've looked at the syllabus. Now we're ready for the two more meaty parts of the today's lecture, and that's to provide a little overview on the course. And then we'll get into chapter one, which is introduction to vector spaces. Before we move on, were there any lingering questions relative to the passport assignment or the syllabus that come to mind? Yes. Oh, so how is the passport supposed to be turned in? Good question. Now at the top menu, or I don't know if it's blue or red, somewhere on the D2L website, there's the content link. That's where you will find all of the material, mostly. But there's also a link to assignments. And I've created a, it used to be called a Dropbox. But now it's just an assignment. And in there, you'll find the passport assignment. You'll click on that, and you'll be able to upload your document into a file on that page or part of D2L. So you'll submit your passport as a soft copy into or with the assignment tab on the D2L website. Other questions? Good question. Yes. So the question, and please remind me to repeat the question. The first question was, where do I submit my passport assignment? This question was, are all assignments going to be uploaded onto D2L? And the answer is, for those in class, you do not have to upload your written homework assignments. You can hand those physically in to me if you want. If you do want to hand those in, let's say that you're traveling or you are away, or you just want to submit it, maybe it's 
after it may be due other than a time that we physically meet, you can put it into my mailbox in the ECE building, a hard copy, or you can scan and upload it too. I'll try to make drop boxes available for all of the homework assignments. Obviously, if you're taking the class online, I don't want you to fly into Tucson and submit each homework assignment unless you want to take the time, the money, and the effort to do that. Then enjoy your trip and your travel to Tucson. It's a nice place to visit, right? <laughs> Pardon? Yes, and you might want to sign up for frequent flyer mileage. Other questions? Let's then move into why do you why should you be interested in this course an overview and then we'll get into chapter 1 type material one way to think about this class advanced linear system theory is it's part of linear systems all of our systems that we will talk about are linear systems nonlinear opens up a different direction it's there's enough material to focus simply on linear systems and you can think then about having some kind of system that maps between diff two different signals. You have an input signal, and that then gets manipulated or adjusted or modified and will give you some <coughs> different domains where these systems might arise and you'll have a better feel or connection for this block that I'm labeling as a system. But now this system you could think of as mapping one set of signals into another set of signals and when we have this system in between them we usually think of the two signals between the or that are connected with this map as being an input set of signals and an output set of signals. Now, with that particular picture in mind, we're very visual and it's nice to be able to draw things, but unfortunately, if we get into infinite dimensions, I can't draw an infinite dimensional space. I can start to visualize three dimensions by walking around in the room. We have the floor, which might be the XY plane, and then I might go up in the Z direction. I apologize for those of you that are online, but you can be visually or visualizing me walking around in the classroom to illustrate X, Y, and Z. My location, maybe my head location throughout the room. But you can extend that idea algebraically. The two-dimensional, the three-dimensional, now when we go into four dimensions, now we can be thinking algebraically with what are we doing or how are we manipulating this. But this connection of input signals through a map to create additional signals, maybe output signals, this signal and system configuration or structure is found in many different domains or is very common. Suppose that I make a column that's a system and then I start doing different classes or domains on the left, one that is near and dear to my heart might be the control environment or that domain where a system could be a controller or it could be the plant dynamics that's not a tree or a flower. That plant is actually the equations of motion of maybe a vehicle or a robot or a 
disk drive or an electrical circuit or a mechanical system. That's our plant. The system could be the interconnected structure of all of that. That might be our system that now maps between input signals and output signals in a control environment. That's one application. Another application might be in the domain of signal processing. And here our system in the rightmost column might be a filter some kind of filter that processes that information. Maybe your input signal is noisy and you want to clean it up. And now how do you clean that up? It might depend on the source of noise. If it's high frequency, now you have a low pass filter. And that's how you connect the input and the output. Maybe the domain is communications. Like we had multiple systems in the control area, we also have different systems or subsystems in a communications environment. For example, you might have a transducer, a microphone, or a microphone in your phone that's now picking up this information. It may be encoding it. You might have an encoder. You now might want to do more than just blast that out to the entire world, you may want to modulate that piece of information so that you can connect it more easily to distant locations. And so now you do some modulation strategy and you could then think of this entire little piece as maybe pre-processing of an input signal to an output signal. And you could have inputs and outputs with all three of those little pieces in that circled environment. You could also think of the system being the channel that you're communicating with. You're sending this modulated signal through these airwaves. Or maybe you're communicating with a satellite in space. You now have some channel that changes the input signal into an output signal or maps between those. Once it gets through the channel, maybe you have to do sort of the reverse of what you did at the first. And so now you might have to demodulate, decode, and maybe now go through a speaker, another transducer. So that now I can circle that and maybe call that post-processing. And you could group all of those and say, oh, I have this communication system. And I'm starting with some input signal, going through all of those different pieces to produce an output signal. It's really how do you define or what do you define to be your system? and it depends on what you're trying to do. But you can see that we now have many different ways of using this one representation, this one image, this one picture to capture many different domains of application. A further application domain could be optics, where now you have some input signal, it goes through optics, or optical hardware, that might now be your system and generates an output signal where the optical hardware is accomplishing or performing the task or the processing that you're wanting to achieve between the input and the output. That's this general setting that this class is concerned with. A lot of times we divorce ourselves from the application, specific application, and we just start talking about signals or vectors. And vectors we put in quotes because it's not necessarily this tall column of numbers. 
It might be something more general, but we might still call it a vector. Luckily, and now I'm getting ahead of myself, but luckily we can start to generalize this into a set, a domain of linear systems theory. Luckily, we can generalize and fold a large number of application areas into a common mathematical framework. And you might hear us talk about being able to ab abstract what we're dealing with into a more clean or sort of mathematical way of thinking. So our abstract math environment will be basically the title of the course. That's our advanced linear systems theory, but now we're worrying about linear vector spaces. That's the term that encompasses what we're playing with in this class. And relative to linear vector spaces, I've already hinted at two ways of sort of separating this out. We can go initially and look at linear algebra, which is finite dimensional. And that's our first reference textbook. That's the Axler textbook. Or we could then, and we will in this class, go in another direction, which might be labeled functional analysis. In functional analysis, now we are dealing with infinite dimensional vectors. And that's the second book in our collection of books for this class, which is the Franks textbook. The nice thing is when we learn a little bit about one, it may directly apply to the other. And so hopefully what we are learning in one domain will have direct or very closely connected application in the other domain or in the other dimension, depending on how we want to refer to it, meaning both domains share many features. And we want to take advantage of that. We want to optimize the way that we're thinking about that or connect. When you're learning, it usually is helpful if you can relate what you're, this new material that you're learning with something that you already know. And if we really, really get a good handle on the finite dimensional, it will make the infinite dimensional a little easier to understand or work with. For that reason, we will try to take advantage of what we learn in one of the domains to help us understand or develop insight into the other domain.
we're looking then at finite dimensional linear algebra functional analysis but during that process we want to also enhance our ability to think mathematically or raise or elevate our mathematical maturity that's one of the goals of this class This course will also try, and it's a lot on you. In order to learn, you're gonna, it's going to be on you to develop this. For example, if you go out and try to run a marathon without practicing, good luck. The same with learning some of this, these new skills. You need to not just show up for the final. You're going to have to be working at it all semester long so that it comes a little bit more easily by the final. So this course will also try to develop our mathematical maturity by not shying away from these objects called proofs. A lot of times, maybe in the past, oh, that you can show that in the math class, or don't worry about that proof. Now we probably want to worry about that proof, to try to elevate our understanding and our ability to move beyond in whatever domain that we're working with. When we're learning new material, if we're always talking in the abstract, it stays abstract sometimes. And what we will try to do is make some connections with reality so that we aren't always in the abstract setting. And if you've already looked at the course resource page, you've seen some of these maybe sources of connection with reality. We will use some interesting and maybe you'll learn that what I mean by interesting, maybe that's also fun, papers or resources. to connect the theory with reality. So on the D2L course page, the module labeled course resources will contain this information. It should contain the second textbook, which is signal theory, but it will also contain some other papers or pieces of textbooks. One is based as a paper talking about principal component analysis. Or maybe we'll start throwing acronyms around. PCA. Principal Component Analysis. What is that? Very briefly. Maybe you now have some data. And already I've maybe simplify this data by just saying it's two-dimensional. It has an X and a Y coordinate. But now maybe you're trying to understand one main feature of that data. Or can I sort of, what's the main direction or what's the principal component in that XY collection of data? Maybe you could have a line 
that is the principal component of that data. What we're trying to do is, oh, and everybody now has heard about big data. Now, if you have all this data, what do I extract from it? How can I pull useful information? One way might be to use principal component analysis, where we're now trying to find meaning from data. Connecting that back to linear algebra type concepts, now maybe we will, to understand PCA or principal component analysis, that might then rely on our understanding of symmetric matrices. Maybe we need to know a little bit about eigenvalues. Maybe we need to know a little bit about eigenvectors. Or another acronym, or acronym, SVD, singular value decomposition. That, those concepts play a role in PCA, principal component analysis, how to extract or find meaning in a collection of data. Maybe you can't see it by looking at it and now you make sense of it via principal component analysis. That's one application paper. Checking my colors to make sure I'm consistent. BCS. Wish he would quit using so many three-letter. So what is this? This is something that no longer really exists. But it was very, very important to many, many different people. The Bowl Championship Series. How are we going to identify the best team among 120 college football teams when what? They don't all play themselves. It might be easy if they all paired up and they played each other and we go, okay, which team won most of their games? But maybe we have 125 teams and they only play 11 teams in a course of a season. How do we now figure out which team is the best? Maybe we don't just shrug our shoulders. Maybe we put it into an algorithm. Maybe we form or use some linear algebra. What this is doing is we are hoping now to rank football teams. Again, maybe we have 125 teams playing 11 different games and they aren't all the same 11 teams, so how do we do this? Matrices to the rescue. This is based on positive matrices and using that to now identify maybe the number one team out of 125, even though they are not playing the same teams. And I've done this with some freshmen a year ago. I had to go into an honors class and give them a lecture, and I said, let's learn some linear algebra. So I had them throwing pennies a certain distance, and I said, who's the best penny team or penny tossing team? And we basically used these same techniques. They didn't all participate or play against each other, but based on the scoring between pairwise competitions, we could sort of determine which team was the best at tossing their set of pennies. Same idea, just a little different than football teams. But it used these same concepts. Here we are talking about positive matrices. Maybe that doesn't excite you, football. Who cares, huh? Maybe.
Maybe not. Maybe the next one gets you a little bit more excited. Google. Or how in the world did Google become so successful? And it was probably their ability to rank content on the internet. How did they, how was it more successful at ranking which website was going to give you more useful information for the keywords that you typed in? How did that happen? How did they become this great company at identifying which web pages were the most important to you based on your keyword search. There's a paper that sort of walks you through that learning process and it's basically called the 25 billion dollar eigenvector. You didn't know eigenvectors were so important, did you? Or so valuable. But that's essentially when Google went public, that was their capitalization after going public. It was $25 billion. Their page rank was all based on an eigenvector. Or a big part of it. it was understanding how do we now rank pages relative to this information and maybe the way that these pages are interconnected. Maybe that can now be some direction where you don't really think about a direction relative to the internet, but now maybe you can relative to these pages and page rank. The linear algebra concept is then eigenvectors and other concepts dealing with matrices. Those are some applications that are fun that you can, well, you could even maybe turn those into your project or you can find another application that you might want to pursue that will be a project at the end of this semester. And one of the nice features about this paper on the page rank, the Google page rank, is it sort of walks you through the process of how you might read a paper and ask questions as you're going, and that's what you might do for your project. You might identify a, pr a paper that you're really interested in that's related to this class, and now you say, how can I step somebody through and help them better understand the concepts, the ideas in this paper based on my reading and interpretation and asking the right questions. That's the motivation for the class. If you aren't excited now, I can administratively drop you. No, if, you, if you're not excited now, Hopefully you will be after you start learning about chapter one, which is where we're headed now. Chapter one of the first book, which is Axler. We've talked about football, and what do you play football on? A field. And we need a field to start playing with linear algebra. Don't roll your eyes. We have to make connections, right? So in this class, or for some background, we will concentrate on two fields, not a football field or a soccer field, but this is now, I put it in quotes because this is 
a term that's used in math, and we need to figure out definitions and feel comfortable with this. If you look at, I believe it's page 10 of the third edition of Axler, that's the one that you have access to, he talks more about fields. And fields, in a very general sense, are sets from which we can, in our case, pull numbers from. Fields could be more general than numbers, but we will concentrate on numbers. Instead of soccer field, baseball field, football field, our fields will be R. That's a funny R, but that means it's the real numbers. That's what I'm meaning by and hopefully you understand the real numbers. One of the course ref resources is the first few chapters of Penrod, a book by Penrod, and he talks about the numbers, the counting numbers, then the real numbers, the rational numbers, and makes all these connections, gives you a history of that. That's one of the fields, is our numbers will be real numbers. We'll draw from those. Those will be our elements in matrices or in our vectors. They will be the scalars that we're playing with. The other one, you can probably anticipate the other set. That's the complex numbers. And you probably are very familiar with real numbers. You need to get just as familiar with complex numbers. These are our two fields or sets that we will be pulling numbers from. And in complex numbers, those are typically maybe labeled as, I'll go ahead and use I since we're playing with math, but in electrical and computer engineering, a lot of times we don't like I because that's reserved for current, and we use a J. But we're calling, it's the same, it's referring to the same square root of minus 1. Complex numbers are then this collection of real numbers, A and B, combined in this way of A plus square root of minus 1 times B. These two dots mean such that A and B are elements of the real numbers, where this is now defined to be is an element of. What are some of the properties of a field? Well, it's green and it has things on it that are about this tall. Hopefully it's not has been doesn't have any divots, no. What properties do our real numbers and complex numbers need to possess? Here you might see definition 1.3 on page 3 of the book. Our real and complex numbers need to satisfy a commutativity property, meaning if we have A and B, an element of F, and maybe I've not even told you what F is, but I will at some point. Actually, it's a little bit further, but F can be either R or C. The book, when it can be either, it just uses F to denote, oh, you could either refer this to the real numbers or the complex numbers. It applies equally to either one, so if that's the case, let's just call it F for a generic field. Commutativity means A plus B if we're talking about additive property, then it doesn't really matter the order of that addition. A plus B is equal to B plus A, and we can also then have multiplicative or the multiplicative.
property where these multiplication it commutes. AB is equal to BA. Obviously that's not the case for matrices. But these are not matrices, these are numbers from our two fields, either real or complex. We have the associative property. If A, B, and C, all three belong to one of the fields, then it really doesn't matter how we associate those when we combine them either with addition we add A and B and then we add that result to C is the same as A added to the sum of B and C. Or if we were worried about multiplication, we could multiply A and B and then multiply that by C or we could say that that's the same as multiplying B and C and then multiplying that by A. That's associativity. We also have identities. With our field of numbers. And because we have a field, then by definition, 0 and 1 exist in that field. We have a 0 and 1 in our F, since F is a field. And we can now have an identity, an additive identity, which says that 0 plus A is equal to A. Again, we're assuming that A is an element of our field. And 1, which is a scalar in our field, multiplied by A, gives us A. Those are our two identity relationships. One based on addition, one based on multiplication. If we have a field of numbers, then we have to have inverses. Now let's use a little bit more shorthand in math. Upside down A. What's that mean? For all. So instead of me writing all the time for all, I might just draw an upside down A. For all A in our field, F, backward E, this is there exists. a minus A that needs to be in our field such that if we add, combine minus A with A, we get zero. That's one inverse. Then we can also talk about a multiplicative inverse. If we say now for every and this is important, non-zero element A in our field of numbers. Again, that field could be real or complex field, so we're writing as it is an F. There exists another element in that field, which a lot of times we label as a to the minus 1, such that that a to the minus 1 multiplied by a gives us 1. So there it's a multiplicative inverse. We multiply those two numbers in our field together and we get 1. We have a field, then it needs to have an additive inverse. We need to be able to find, given any number in that field, there has to be another 
number that you could pair up with it such that when you add them together you get zero. One more property for a number to be, a, or this set of numbers to be a field is our distributive property. Again, let's take three elements in this field, A, B, and C. Then it needs to be the case that if we multiply A times the sum of B and C, we can distribute that multiplication across the summation, or that's equal to AB plus AC. Now I've already given you some examples. Let me just write those down. R real numbers. That's a field. So if we wanted to play on that field, we could. We could say, oh, your field of numbers, and these are what? Making up the elements in a vector, and there are scalars. We're playing over the field of real numbers. That's what we're using. Or we could say, let's have our field be the complex numbers. Or we could have Q with a line through it. Rational numbers, those form a field. They satisfy all of those five properties that we just listed. Rational numbers being A divided by B, where B is non-zero. We can now find that all of those five properties hold true for rational numbers, they hold true for real numbers, and they hold true for complex numbers. All of these are fields. To be a potential candidate for a field, we need a set. And let's say we have the set of integers. That's a Z with a line through it. Is that a field? If I have two integers and I add them up or multiply them, does it matter the order? That's okay, isn't it? What about associativity? Does it matter how I group them before I add them or multiply them with integers? That seems to be okay. You're ahead of me, so I'll scroll down. Can you find an integer that has another integer which, when multiplied together, generate one? Well, now if I give you 4, can you find an integer which when multiplied by 4 will give you 1? No. So this is not a field. And the reason is it fails to have a multiplicative inverse. And now let me just write down what I had said before relative to this use of that F. Many times we will be able to prove results for both fields the real
real numbers and the complex numbers at the same time or simultaneously. If that's the case, then instead of deriving it for R's and then deriving it for C or then keep saying, oh, this is true for R and C, we just cut to the chase and say F. It's good for F, where F could be either R or C. Thus, the book, the first book, Axler, uses F for either R or C. Now we have fields, something to play with. Now what we want to do, and those were simply scalars. Now what we want to do is build up more interesting objects. And the first way that we're going to do that is to talk about a list. Where a list is an ordered pair, or an ordered group, of some n, where n is a finite number. We're not letting n march off to infinity. It's some finite number. An ordered group of n objects. And as I said before, most of the time our objects are usually numbers. So the question was, how general can we make this f? Or how general is f? Let's just stick with what the book says. f is only going to be r and c. So it might be possible to verify or show some of the results for a different kind of field rather than reals and complex. But let's just try to, when we see an f, don't overgeneralize. Just assume that that's only for R and C unless you want to show it's true for something other than that. So we will just restrict F to only be R and C, the real numbers and complex numbers. It might be true that in some cases it holds for rational numbers. That's fine. But we're not going to make that encompassing aspect for F. We'll just say F is just going to res be restricted to R or C. Here, now we're going to play with those f sets of numbers, which are fields, by putting them together in a list, where we might have X sub 1, X sub 2, up to X sub n where x1, x2, x sub n, again, little n is finite. It's a million. It's a hundred. It's four. Little n is some finite number. All of these are elements or elements in our set, either R or C. If little n was two, then maybe we refer to that as consider the ordered pair or ordered pairs. Or this is now a two-dimensional plane if little n is two. If little n is three, now we have an ordered triple. And you could visualize this still. Now maybe it's a point in space, in three-dimensional space, if little n is three. If it's something bigger, maybe we don't yet specify. We just say it's an n-tuple. Now it's n, where n is finite if it's a list. 
To make matters maybe more confusing, but hopefully it's clear from the context, is when possible, we might group all of those n elements in our list into one variable. Maybe if it's x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 5, we just call the whole thing x. When possible, we will use a single variable to represent an entire list. Meaning maybe we just say x when in fact that is now the parameterized form or a way of collecting x1, x2, x sub n. One note or comment that we need to keep straight is the fact that a list is not a set. What do we mean by that? Order and repetition are important or actually matter in a list. Here's the distinction. Suppose that I say, oh, here's a set, and it contains 2, 4, and 4. If that's a set that contains 2 and 4 and 4, my set contains an orange and an apple and an apple. What's in that set? An orange and an apple. So I could refer to that as 2 and 4. Or, that's the same as an apple and an orange. Obviously, I'm getting hungry if I'm starting to talk. I can always talk about food. I can always eat food also. Oh, the microphone's picking that up, isn't it? I must be hungry. That's a set. 244, 2442, they're the same. But a list... Those are not the same, are they? If I now give you a list, that's not what I wanted to give you. Maybe it's now 2, 4, and 4. It's an apple, an orange, and an orange. That's not the same as an orange, an apple, and an orange in a list. And that's definitely not the same as an apple and an orange. Order matters where those elements are in your list, and repetition matters. You could have four, 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 four. A lot of fours. And that list then is specific. That's not the same as having a set that has the number four in it. If order and repetition matter, then it's important where that element is located. And we have a word for that. What is its coordinate? Given a list, we need to be able to talk about specific locations in that list or where is its, what is its coordinate. An element of a list is going to be determined by its coordinate. For example, and sometimes I might just write EG, for example, another shorthand. 
if we had the list x, which is now x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub n, then we could refer to x sub 1 as our first coordinate. x sub 2, I think you can guess, that's the second coordinate. x sub 3, the third coordinate. We can just keep going. x sub n is the nth coordinate. Now that we have this list of elements that belong to our field of numbers, now we can start playing with those. We can do addition. List addition is just addition on each element, element-wise, or element-wise addition. List addition is element-wise addition of the coordinates. Meaning if z is the sum of lists x and y, then we just add up the first coordinate of x and y and put that in the first coordinate of z. We add up the second coordinates in x and y, etc., down to the nth coordinates of x and y, and those now become the respective coordinates in our list z. That's addition, how we define or how we add vectors or lists in linear algebra. We also might like to scale these lists or use scalar multiplication. Where now multiplication of a list by a scalar number A in our field. And that's simply defined as element-wise multiplication by a scalar or by the scalar, where the scalar is A. So that A, scalar A times our list X, A now is going to scale each of our coordinates. A times X sub 1, A times X sub 2, A times X sub n. Now that we have this list or these lists available to us, now we can start playing with them by creating a vector space. And we're doing that right now or today with a list. And what does a list mean? Distinction, now I'm trying to think about the way we started the class and we said we have part of it dealing with linear algebra, another part with functional analysis. When I say we're playing with a list, which piece are we talking about? What does list imply? Finite order and repetition. That's all important. So that now our vector space that we're dealing with is finite dimensional. In the third edition of Axler, this is now starting on page 12. Relative to a vector space, what you can start to think about is it's dealing with three concepts. It's or the main idea behind a vector space 
is we have three things involved or three concepts. First we have a set with which we'll be playing with and that set, the way that we will play with that, the elements in that set, and this set is maybe a collection of lists, now that set we will be using two binary operations on that collection of elements in that set. Binary means there's two things with each of the operations. One is that we have one of the binary operations is vector addition. Where again here I'm going to sort of put that in the cloud, the vector. These are elements of our set which might be something other than these tall thin columns. It might be a mat matrix, that might be our vector. I'm using this vector in an abstract sense. I'm abstracting out what we might typically think of as a vector. That's one of the binary operations is addition. The other one is scalar multiplication. So we have a set with two operations on it. Addition and scalar multiplication. Let's now look at the definition of vector spaces. Here we're saying any set V. So we'll call this set that we're playing with capital V. And what belongs to that set is a bunch of lists. And lists are finite order matters and repetition matters. So we now have this set V that has the following properties. One property is that this set of lists is closed under addition. What do I mean by closed, under addition? If I have this set and it has a bunch of lists in it, I can pull a list out and I can pull another list and I can try to add them. What happens to their sum if it's closed under addition? The sum needs to be belonging to that set. It's closed under addition. I can pick any element from that set or any list from that set and when I add them together that sum will belong to the set. So I can have an x plus y that's also contained in my set V. Whenever or for all or when x and y begin in that V. And it's closed under scalar multiplication. Which means that AX is in the set when X was the list in that set, V, and A is in our underlying field of numbers. Yes.
So a vector space is a set. And once we have that set, then we want that set or that collection of lists to be closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. And now we have these different properties that need to be satisfied. And I think what I'm going to do is once I get back to my office, I'm just going to list those. It's like commutativity. A vector x plus a vector y is the same as a vector y plus a vector x. Associativity. Those kind, we have an additive inverse. Those properties are what are possible or exist for a vector space. And we'll pick up with examples of different vector spaces the next time we meet.